What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Creative Collective Show in Quarantine. My name is Dan. I'm Zach. And today we have Rosie uh, from Matteo with us. How's it going, Rosie? Good. Thanks for having me today. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> little little uh, podcast to break up the day. Never hurt, you know? No, it's good. Um, before we get started, uh, just to let everyone know, um, if you have listened to this podcast before, if you're listening on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, uh, it's really helpful to us for you to leave a comment, hit the share button, hit the like button, and also leave us a review on any podcast platform that you listen to us on. Uh, it lets us know how we're doing and and how we can improve, or it lets us know that you you know you love what we're doing. So. It uh, means a lot to us uh, when you guys give us feedback or share uh, out any of our content. Um, let's keep the intro short today, Zach, and we'll, we'll just kind of get into it. Um, Agreed. So, yeah. Rosie, thanks so much again for joining us. Um, tell everyone who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Rosie Matteo. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm founder of Matteo Communication. We are a strategic marketing agency focused on the cannabis industry. Awesome. And um, what do you guys do uh, within your agency? So we offer a wide range of services for uh, cannabis companies. Uh, we started as a media relations firm um, in 2014. So we've been doing cannabis PR for almost six years now. Um, and then we've expanded to do social media, investor relations, content marketing, SEO, SEM, programmatic, um, ad buying. So a, a broad range of services for cannabis companies. Very cool. Now your your come up story from how you got here uh, is really interesting, and I and I would love to dive into that, uh, especially for our listeners today. Um, you know, just hearing how you got started and um, like how you even got into this space. And I know um, it's a very interesting story, so I'm ready to hear it. Yeah. So um, this is um, I never expected that I'd run a leading cannabis marketing agency. My background had been traditionally in food and technology PR. I'd worked for some really top restaurants in New York City, specialty food. I worked for my husband's startup and really got into tech PR. Um, and in 2014, my husband's job moved us out. 2013, my husband's job moved us out to Seattle, Washington. Washington had just gone adult use um, on the cannabis side. And around that time, I was approached to do the launch of a crowdfunding campaign for a cookbook because I had food and tech background, not because I had cannabis background, but it was a cannabis cookbook. So that was just a short project. And when Fast Company, New York Times, Mashable, Time Magazine were all clamoring for the story um, because I was pitching mainstream media because that was really my background. A light bulb went off in my head and I said, you know, I can bring my mainstream approach to public relations to this burgeoning new industry. Um, and that was the beginning of it. And because we just moved to Washington and there was a small a cannabis tech startup scene, I started networking and I picked up uh, one of my first clients, uh, which is a company called Headset. And we're still with them today. The founders are the founders of Leafly. This is like their second startup in the cannabis space. That was one of my first agency of record clients. Oh, wow. You said you said Leafly? Yes, so they're the founders of Leafly. Sai, so Scott, uh, Brian Wanslich, and um, Scott Vickers, they were the guys who founded Leafly. They just exited to Privateer, and they were starting their new venture, which is Headset, which is a data analytics company. And some of my work in technology had been in data analytics, so it was a very natural fit for me. It just happened to be cannabis data, which was very, very rare back then to have actually any data on the cannabis industry. So... I was very fortunate to meet those guys and hit it off, and they became one of my first clients. And now six years later, it's not just me in Seattle. We're 17 people, 40 clients, um, and based in New York City with, with offices opening um, in L.A. and in Toronto later in the year. That's crazy. So do you have a... Um a, uh, a, a passion for the industry? Like, like why cannabis? I, I know cannabis was, a, you said you had just moved to Washington and it had just become legal for adults. Was that um, recreational or was that like, like, like 100% uh, recreational? 
Yeah, so before 2013, uh, Washington had had a long uh, time medical market, and in 20 and in 2013, it moved over to adult use. So anybody could go into a cannabis dispensary um, and buy cannabis. So even I'd be, I'm, I'm a mother of four, and if you guys know this, I'd be driving my kids to school in the morning, and at 8 a.m. in the morning, there'd be lines outside of the dispensary. So it was really part of the scene there. Um, yeah. and it was very fortuitous that we moved there, and I really started to learn about it. And I had not been a cannabis consumer really since college. I lived in New York um, and, Chicago, and in Illinois, and those were not legal states. So it really wasn't part of my life. Um, but I moved to Seattle. I started like learning about you know different types of cannabis that were available. They were not the stuff they were used to having in college. They were being big pens and edibles. Um, and also, when I started um, a cannabis practice, I really wanted to learn about the industry. I, I am very open that. I was not familiar really with the space, but the more I learned and the more stories I started to hear about the positive impact for cannabis on people's lives, the more of an advocate I became. When you start hearing stories about people who have anxiety and haven't slept in 10 years and they start taking cannabis and now they're getting rest, or you're hearing that people who are nausea from cannabis, um, I mean from cancer and they take cannabis to cure that, like how can you not believe in the power of a plant I and know. an advocate? So that's really it's like my true. connection. Yeah, it's it's wild. You hear all these stories, and there's so many. Like it's not just one or two. And there's there's so many that have, um, uh, what's the where like they have, they have like epilepsy and they have they, they go through the, these like seizures and now like they're they're getting like eighty percent or ninety percent less seizures because they're t they're taking like like uh, CBD, which you know yeah, I comes from correct. the cannabis guy, but unfortunately. Wild. One of the warriors in the space, uh, Charlotte Figi, she was a thir she's 13 year old and, and she passed away last week, but she really helped move the industry forward. She was a child who had Javette syndrome, which was a severe form of epilepsy um, and CBD. Um, really changed her life for the better. And Sanjay Gupta did a whole special on her uh, five, six years ago and really helped uh, um, the medical side of the industry, you know, gain visibility. So um, yeah, so the power of cannabis and CBD is unbelievable when you hear the stories. I remember reading that article a couple of days ago, now that you mentioned that, um, that was a really big thing. Yeah, like for 13 year old, she really made such an impact on the world. So, you know, we always pay a lot of tribute to her. That's awesome. It's wild. Um, I wanted to get into um, some of your first ways into market as being a a um, a uh, PR uh, company in the cannabis space. Like, like, what was your first steps in working with some of those first clients and like getting the name out and like, you know, spreading, I guess, like the the truth about like what cannabis can do. Yeah. So um, I really approached it from the beginning, just like I would any product, and that's how a lot of people are thinking about it now. Um, but a few years ago. The only way I knew how to do things was to pitch the type of stories that I thought my media contacts would like. And I knew from my experience that data was a very big um, part of, of the story. Just to say, like, this is a great edible, like, who cares? But if we can right. show that you know, edibles are growing by X percent in this stage or this market, um, that was a way to start telling those stories. So we always use data to start telling um, the stories in cannabis. And also, in 2014, Cannabis was really starting to have a change as like a consumer packaged good product. Um, and so everything was looking like products that I was used to buying in my Sephora um, or in my Whole Foods. It was, it was really the beginning of what we're seeing today is like modern cannabis. So we approach it just like we would any product. And while we always pitch the cannabis publications, I thought, you know, this package, we work with Candescent, which is a luxury cannabis brand. This could be in Vogue. And you know what? We went for it. We pitched Vogue and we were responsible for the first story ever written in Vogue because we were approaching like with any product. And same thing with headset. Um, just like you know, client for a long time. We went to Bloomberg for people who were covering data. They wanted to hear about cannabis data. So I think using that approach of just being traditional block and tackling PR helped us get into the space. And now everybody's covering it, and there's so many different products and firms working in the space, but I think that really helped us the way we thought about it back then has helped us today. Very cool. Uh, before we go any further, if you are watching on Facebook or on YouTube, leave a comment for our guests. If you have any questions at all, we'd love to get those answered for you. As well as if you're watching on live, comment hashtag live in the comments on Facebook or YouTube. Also comment hashtag replay if you're watching the replay of this and you're not uh, joining us live. Um, all right, let's 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 keep going, guys. Awesome, awesome. So you got into this 
this this space. You started helping out businesses. Uh, you started with the, like your your traditional grassroots tactics and and, and leading with data. Um, what was ha- has it changed since you got into the industry? And you know, are there any like politics around how you go about talking about PRs or, or, or sorry, talking about cannabis um, in like a positive light with regard to like what you're allowed to, like, like, like allowed to advertise and like in that kind of thing? Right, so this is interesting. Um, cannabis PR is really having a moment because there are so many restrictions um, for, for advertising cannabis. So right now, Google does not allow you to advertise cannabis products. Facebook, Instagram, you can't boost a post. So um, what's a great way to get the word out is through PR because you can uh, have a magazine write a story and then you can you know post that. You guys are doing a podcast. We can reshare this. So PR is really having a moment, but things have changed um, in many ways. So when I first started pitching it, we were some of the first stories that were ever pitched. Right now, every cannabis company has a publicist, right? Um, there are a few like really like name brand products. Now there are 50, 60, hundreds vying for attention. So like it's getting, getting very crowded. Um, but if you have really great storytelling, great relationships, um, you're really able to, to get the word out about a client. For sure. And then you said you worked with um, companies like Vogue. And I, I know from, from doing a, a little bit of research that uh, you, you've got into uh, Oprah Magazine as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. So again, um, I really leaned into my relationships um, from years and years of doing food and tech PR. So I was very close with um, the lifestyle uh, food editor at Oprah Magazine. I traveled with her around the world doing food tours uh, for many years. Um, and like her mandate was really to find out what was happening in the lifestyle side of the world for Oprah. So when I started working with Candescent, which is a luxury cannabis brand, I said, Molly, you got to come see what, what modern day cannabis looks like. It's not what you think. So we flew out to California together and she toured the facility um, and she got a look at what it means to make, you know, luxury cannabis. Um, and now that, that opened her eyes to what was possible um, in this newfound world of, of marijuana. So about six months later, she got the green light to write a story about cannabis um, in mainstream America. So she took a trip out to Kikoko, which is not a client of ours, but like a woman's focused um, tea brand that up for cannabis. And she wrote the story and then she sidebarred a few of our clients. But really, we she she credits us to opening her eyes to really what was happening in the space. And now she's written about Oprah's written about cannabis a couple of times. So we feel really grateful that we've been able to, you know, move this mainstream message forward that cannabis is for everybody. It's for your mom. It's for um, you dealing with anxiety when mainstream media is covering it. We believe that helps gain acceptance, you know, to a mass audience. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's really cool to see how far it's come and like where it's going. Um, I kind of wanted to get into like the idea of like, you know, with it being uh, an election year, you know, how does this help out or not help out in the cannabis industry and like, or the cannabis sphere? And like, are you guys doing anything around that? Is that, are you, is that playing into like how you guys reach out to people? I mean, it's an election year and the polls show that cannabis is actually a bipartisan um subject you know both sides of the aisle see like the you know the validity of, of a legal cannabis market um you know i'm not one to predict what will happen but we're always hopeful that more states will come online um and more people can get access to this really important plant for sure for sure so um can we bring it back a little bit and can we talk a little bit about like your aha moment when you were starting uh your your company and what what that looked like and you know tell us a little bit about that so um, I have had a few aha moments. So I think the, the original campaign was um, was an aha moment when I uh, pitched the New York Times and they said, we have the exclusive. Now, I'd always been good at what I had done, but never within 30 seconds had the New York Times like said, can we please have the exclusive on the story? So I knew there that we were in a, a new industry that, you know, reporters would be clamoring for stories. So once I, I took on that project, like I was all in. Um, and then it's, it's steadily started to grow my business. Um, you know, I had headset, then I worked with a company called Hi There. I'm still with them today. We coined them as the Tinder for tokers when we launched them because they were um, a, a social network for cannabis. And that was a really, really successful campaign. We had 500 articles like in the first week for that account. So wow. you, like success, we get success. So once that hit, I was like, this is really, 
we've got something here. And then slowly over the next three, four years, the company started to grow. And then I had a hot moment um, at, at the dinner table with my husband, actually. Like my company was starting to scale. Um, it was just me and, and one of my friends was helping me out as an assistant, but the people wanted to work with us and it was starting to, I couldn't do it by myself. I had 12 clients by myself. Like when I tell people that now, they're That's like, crazy. That's crazy, how did you do it? But I was so excited every day I would jump out of bed, um, couldn't wait to hit the ground running. So I was just doing it, but it was getting overwhelming. I was getting really stressed out. Um, my husband said to me, Rose, you've got to scale this business. Like he's been, uh, he's been building companies and worked in finance for many years. So he saw what meant to like scale a business. And he said to me, I said, I can't scale a business. I'm just like doing what I do. And he said, no, no, no. One day, can you imagine you get up in the morning, you take the kids to school, you work out at the gym and you walk into your office um, with your Starbucks and there are people there working. And I said, Dan, that will never happen. For many years, I have been a many of an a long time entrepreneur. He'd been watching what I had been doing, and he said to me, um, "What are you doing here, Rosie? Like you got something here?" Again, I said, "I can't like grow a business. I just do what I do. I'm just a, a publicist, and I talk to media and I talk to my clients. Like I can't start a company." He said, "Well, I can." And fast forward six months later, we had an office set up. We had five people working for us. I was walking in with my Starbucks and everybody was working and that was the aha moment. I was like, oh my God, we've got a company here. And now six months later, this is all within two years. Like I said, we were 17 people, 40 clients, huge offices in the city and opening more offices. So we've had a few aha moments that have brought us to this point, um, but it's been so much fun and so really grateful to have been able to push past those moments and make it happen. That's awesome. That's wild. Can you tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the process of starting uh, the 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 uh, I'm lost for words here. The growth of your company, right? So when you flipped the switch and said, "Okay, we're going to start hiring people," can you tell me a little bit about that and maybe any struggles that you uh, encountered there? Yeah. So, like I said, like building a company was not in my wheelhouse. So I'm a firm believer in, and I said, tell this to my daughters: if you ask for help, right? There are people who can do things better than you. I'm great at client relations. I'm great at media relations. Growing company was not my thing. So when Mitch, who's my partner now, said to me, I can help you grow this company, I was like, let's do this. So I brought on a partner to help me with the infrastructure of the company. So he helped us, you know, figure out what our finances would be, who we could afford to hire, you know, what the projections would look like, how we could grow. Um, and uh, he helped me start setting things up. So uh, I think it was November last year of 2018, uh, we moved into our first offices. We were in co-working space. You know, we've been, just like I grew this slowly, we're, we're scaling in an appropriate way. We started in co-working. There are four of us in a tiny location. And then over the, the next year, really, the buzz started to grow. I had the bandwidth to start bringing in more clients because there are people helping on the account work. Um, and then in July 2019, we moved into our new home at 423 West 55th. I wish it was 420. We're like three buildings off, but we're <laughs> good, right? Um, and then as we have like a metric, as we add more clients, we add more um employees and we try to do this really intelligently, backed by data, uh, to make sure that we're growing in an appropriate way. So um We've been really, I'm really grateful that we've hired the most um, hardworking, incredible uh, team. They're, everybody works so hard and with integrity. I feel really grateful every day that I come in with that coffee and everybody's just crushing it day in and day out. That's so cool. What a, what a crazy story. Like, kind of see how, especially you're using, you know, the, the tools that are available to you. you know, you're, you're starting with co-working and, and, and then, you know, growing from there and branching out of that. And, you know, you have like, you know, backed by data, this this nice little thing that says, based on how many clients you have, this is how many employees you need. And then you can slowly scale up, which is cool. So you're always um, in check. You're always keeping yourself in check. Yeah. You're not overextending yourself. And then also what we did, um, so, you know, we've been growing, we've been growing with people, but we've also been growing with services I mentioned a little earlier. So also when we were having these conversations with these long-term clients, they were starting to think, you know, it's not just public relations we need. We really need somebody to handle like our social media because there's so many restrictions um, in cannabis. We, we were understanding like what was happening. So we started adding that functional expertise. And then we realized a lot of our clients were growing rapidly and they might be going down that route to go public. So we knew we needed to invest in investor relations. 
So something else we did as part of our growth is we actually raised um, a seed round last year, um, which is very rare for a, um, for a firm. But uh, we had a lot of investors in the space that we had become close with who saw what we were doing, and they wanted to take a bet on us. And we knew we wanted to add these um, expertise even before we had the business. We believed if we built it, they would come. And that's proved to be true. So we raised the venture uh, around last year with uh, – Phyto Partners, which is a big um, fund in this space, Delta Emerald Partners, and also um, Alan Patrick from Grey Rock. So I have to fix my hair. It's going to bother me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so, we, so we raised the venture fund to enable us to hire like the best experts as related to SEO and investor relations and social. And a year ago, we had like one client doing one of these eight services. And now I think 50% of our clients do multiple services with us. They, we become a trusted partner. So they believe when they need to add a different marketing um, functionality, they come to us. So um, that was a pretty incredible uh, moment, being able to like announce the, the raising of a round um, and just being able to do the things we want to do when we want to do it. Very cool. Um so we we talked about your aha moment. Is there a specific thing that sticks out in your mind that um, was a struggle for you and that you were really able to learn from that and and come out um, that particular struggle stronger and better? Yeah, so um, like I said, I, we were not a process oriented agency when it was just me, right? So I think uh, making those guardrails around like what it means to be like a really great functioning agency, we had to learn from some mistakes. Like even we uh, had a client that we actually lost and it's very rare for us to lose a client because we just didn't go through like the correct process that we had set in place um, because we were also new to this agency. So um, we had sent out a strategy um, and just started pitching a little too early and we got a message wrong. Um, and we ended up losing the account. So like that's a very humbling experience account that we have like fall hard to win. We messed up and we lost it. So from that experience, we learned, okay, we knew we had a process. We had to follow that process. Um, and as we have, as we're becoming more sophisticated, you bring on more sophisticated clients, really, um, you know, acting in a way that like um, one of the larger agencies would act in. Um, and so we've been, it's been a learning experience um, and we only grow from those. So uh, we took away that, yeah, we suck to lose a client, but um, we're a stronger agency for it. So that would be an example of things we learned as we're like growing this agency like day by day. Awesome. Quick question for you. Where did uh, the name of your company come from? It's my last name. <laughs> and, and oh, so, my God. I am totally. <laughs> but, but actually, this was a conversation we had. Um, my That's partner, so like, funny. I'm so dumb right it's now. It's all right. <laughs> so and this is actually a conversation we had. And that's really to marketing. So what, as we were growing, it used to be RMPR, Rosie Maddie of Public Relations. But we were expanding to not just do PR. So at some point when we were formalizing with the agency would be, Everyone knew me by Rosie, Rosie Matteo. So I felt very strongly that it should have my last name. My partner was like, are you sure you don't want something cool like, you know, like high media or something like that? I was like, no, I don't want to be cutesy like that. That's for sure. But I felt, you know, everyone knows me by me. It has to be my name. But then your name is on the door, right? So like it gives me fire in my belly. It's like my name is on the door. While I'm not doing the work day in and day out, like the team is, like and it's very important that I stay in very involved because the buck stops with me. Um, so I think it keeps me really honest that it's my name. Um, and also like my girls are really proud that um, that my name's on the door. So that's why it's the name. Very cool. Awesome. Now you said uh, you had a lot of support from, you know, from the outside and starting this venture. Was, were there any like, naysayers anyone that said rosie you know this why are you trying to get into the space you're crazy like you know this is not a good place to be like because I, I feel like you took a big leap in you know yes there was one state that that went for it and you saw the market was kind of changing but it wasn't quite there yet you know like what, what were was there anyone that was like you know you're nuts for doing this yeah so there's two stories i'll tell so one like i said my husband helped me with that aha moment to say i need to scale it when i started in 20 uh, 14, we had just moved out to Washington, as I mentioned, and he was working in finance, which is a pretty buttoned up uh, type of industry. So when I first started, I thought everything I was doing was pretty cool. So I'm posting on Facebook, cannabis, this, cannabis, that. And he would say to me, Rosie, like the same last name, like maybe you don't want to be posting about this, you know, about cannabis. 
And I continued to do it. And he was supportive of it, of course. Um, but then when we were moving back to the East Coast, he was interviewing for jobs like four years later um, at finance, at, you know, financial institutions. And he would walk into interviews and say, my wife is the smartest woman alive. She has a cannabis company. So like even the perception there, like what was once buttoned up is now like a selling point is how things mm -hmm. have changed. Um, and then also, which, you know, I, when I started this, a lot of my other like um, colleagues at other PR firms, or other PR founders that I was like friendly with were like, oh, it's so cute what you're doing. Like so funny you're working in cannabis. And I was like, funny, I guess. Now, six years later, I go to cannabis conferences and I see those same founders there trying to pick up cannabis clients. So what was very cute back then is now a viable business. So I always yeah. get a kick out of that. I love that. I love that feeling. Like, yeah, yeah. What's cute about it now, huh? Yeah. She's like, I thought you might be here. I'm like, thought I might be here with 40 clients. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm wow. here. Still here. <laughs> Um, so one one thing I've noticed, and it's it's also been throughout this count this conversation as well, is even the wording behind you know marijuana, pot, cannabis. Um, does that play into it? I, I I feel like we're using the word cannabis more than you know like the the traditional marijuana Mary Jane like yeah. uh, feeling. So I do that like for a reason. First of all, it's the cannabis plant, so that's the official name of it. But you know a lot right, right. of other. Uh, words, the vernaculars are rooted in some just really archaic views of cannabis. Um, so with marijuana, I, you know, has a very long storied history, um, you know, of, of non-inclusion. Um, like I still use them pot weed. I use them interchangeably, um, but really I try to elevate it. And that's really been the approach of our agency to really move the industry forward and get away from some of those like stoner stigmas. Um, so yeah. by design, I use cannabis a lot. That's that's pretty much what I figured because all the older wordage is so like you know rooted in like bad ways of thinking and bad stigma. So I feel like you know cannabis be, being relatively new and you know I guess scientific sounding because it, it is like the root yeah. name of, of where the plant's coming from. Um, it gives it more like validity and you know medicinal purposes. Um, totally. So. Um, there's also something here about um, the Last Prisoners Project. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So we are very proud to be a founding um, founding backers of the Last Prisoner Project. We work at Harbor Side, um, which is one of the you know the the, the most hallowed dispensaries in the country, founded by Steve D'Angelo. Um, it's an incredible, incredible place. Um, and Steve is a founding member of the Last Prisoner Project, whose goal is to make sure that you know while all of us are you know benefiting from from cannabis as a business, you know for our health, for our wellness, that there are people who have been incarcerated because of the war on drugs, and that we really cannot stand for um, moving this industry forward with that unless these people are are free from prisons for what we're profiting for. So we feel like it's our responsibility as a company that's doing well in the cannabis industry to give back and make sure that we are we are not resting until every last prisoner is free. So we feel really, really fortunate to be um, helping that organization and working with Steve and their entire team over there. I love that, I love that. Um, was there something comparable to what happened with the prohibition uh, with alcohol and all that stuff? Like, it, what, is there, do you see any his, like historical similarities between the two in terms of like um, even PR to like you know what the what the market's doing? Um, I'm not an expert on prohibition, but I will say something now. You know, we're we're filming this during like uh, COVID nineteen, um, and uh, during um, prohibition, like it came it came out of prohibition, like after the Great Depression, I believe. I think that's what I've been hearing that like. Um, the move from it being um, illegal to legal uh, happened right after that because it was deemed essential. Um, and right now, cannabis has been deemed essential in so many jurisdictions yes. during COVID nineteen. While so many um, businesses are closed, um, cannabis dispensaries, on the most part, are open. You know, there's some states that have, are only allowing it for medicinal reasons, like Massachusetts, which had a huge rec market um, for the past year, is now only you know medicinal. We're hoping that Baker will retract that so everybody can get access, but. Um, 
in Pennsylvania, we work with a company called um, the Apothecarium. It's part of TerraSend, um, and they've been open. They had some of their best days um, ever since um, uh, COVID-19 hit because people are really trying to get their medicine. They've been uh, able to open up a drive through so people can access their medicine. So people are really adapting um, to this strange time during COVID-19 to make sure that people can get their medicine. That's awesome. Um, is there any is there any help or like relief going to any of these people at all? Like, do, do they even need it in terms of like you said it was deemed essential? So I'm just curious if you know you know like with, with these S, these uh, SBA loans going out, yeah. if if they're allowed in it because of like obviously federal it's federally illegal. So right. So we've been using this term called essential but not equal, um, and it's really disappointing. I know cannabis companies were used to this. You know, we don't get any help from the federal government, but if it's essential and we're bringing in money and we're paying tax dollars. Um, and now we're not able to access the loans that other companies are getting. It's really a shame and it needs to change. Um, but this is like an upward fight that you know, we've been having for years. But like I said, cannabis is keeping people employed right now. Um, and we can't access it. Like we, we need people to, we need to be able to employ people to get people medicine. So I think, there, I know there's a fight um, to reverse that, but it's a challenge. It's crazy. That's super, that's super interesting. And, um, you know, to my knowledge, it's also the same way with banks as well, right? Uh, you can't like use a bank if you uh, have a, a cannabis company as well. Yeah. So we've had some, uh, some really interesting stories around that. I always tell one, which I think is a little funny, but it's not. Um, yeah. So cannabis companies can't legally bank. We're ancillary, so we've been okay. Um, but uh, we've been paid like a five figure retainer in cash because the company couldn't bank and they needed to pay us. So they couldn't do an ACH like a normal company. We figured it out. Now they send us checks, but we've had these really strange moments where I was walking out of like a new business pitch and hands me a wad of cash. Like, Are you kidding me? And I sent a picture to my husband. He's like, what is that? I'm like, that's a retainer. Um, so, and that's not safe. Like I'm driving around like LA with a wad of cash, trying to find a bank to deposit in like that. That is just yeah. not safe. So um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in Washington right now um, to hopefully change some of the banking laws, but it, it, it's a real challenge. And um, even like for marketing, um, when we can't access, um, when companies can't access, you know, capital, um, like other companies can, like they can't get like a small business loan. So any money they raise really needs to go to like their, you know, CapEx, the money they would spend on marketing, like on ads and billboards and events, like it's hard to find that extra dry powder to spend marketing dollars. So uh, cannabis banking like across the industry is an issue. Sure. Um, so we, we spoke about your past a little bit and your present. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have any uh, mentors uh, currently or in the past that, um, you know, really helped you um, in any way, which that you kind of grow as a business person? Yeah, so I have a lot of mentors, um, but I really look back actually like to my family. My mother, my grandmother, my great aunts all worked in a family business um, and they all had families and, and they really what they quote, did it all. They ran successful businesses and had like balance in their life. So I look um you see one of my daughters back there. Um, <laughs> so I um I really look to them. They were able to do it. So I feel that um they really set me up to be able to just go, right? Like it was never a question in my mind, like I can run a business, I can be a mother. So they really are my mentors. I also work with so many of the most accomplished women in the cannabis space. Um, I'll just name a few just because like, they give me so much strength throughout the day because they're all warriors forging a path in this industry. Emily Paxia, who's a co-founder of Poseidon Asset Management, which is one of the top VCs in the space. Carson Humiston is one of the founders we work with. She has a, um, a recruiting agency spoke, uh, focused just on the cannabis space. Jane West, um, Deborah Borchardt. There are just so many women that I work with day in and day out um, that inspire me. And we have like a little tribe and we just push each other forward um, and are helping build this industry together. So I, I have a lot of mentors. Love that. Love that. Um, has it been hard, you know, like dealing with, you know, like you have your family you know, to, to take care of your, your, you're a mom, you know, you're, 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 you're running this business, you know, like how, how do you find the time? How do you manage? Is there any advice you can give to anyone that's kind of trying to do both or, um, especially during this time, you know, like 
we're stuck. Like how, like, this is also a two part question. How are you doing this? How are you managing a team like remotely? Like how are you guys getting around that? Is there any struggles, um, any new software you guys are using? Yeah, so there's a lot. So I'll just talk holistically. Um, sure. so, like I said, uh, asking for help. So part of my story was that you know, I moved out to Washington with my husband for his job. We moved many times in our marriage um, to support his company or his, his work. Um, and in 2019, last summer, we made the decision because my business was growing so rapidly and I was so busy. I was traveling every two weeks um, that somebody needs to be home with our four busy children. And my husband actually after 20 years working um, in finance, um, took a step back and is now home with the kids. So I really have a lot of help. It used to be actual chaos here. I would be running to pick up the kids from school, going to the gym, going to the office, traveling, and they never knew who was picking them up. So um, I feel really grateful that I have such a supportive husband um, who is, is willing to stay home and loves staying home with the kids. He's an excellent father. And it's also a great message to my daughters um, that you can do anything. You can be a successful woman and marry somebody who's totally supportive of everything that you do and will make sacrifices and take care of a family. So that's um, an, an incredible a gift that I have that I have a lot of help at home. That being said, as you, you've seen my daughters run by the office, you know, it's not without challenges, especially during COVID-19. You know, they're off from school for spring break right now, filling their days, um, making sure that you know, my husband gets time away from them, that, you know, I have time. So it, it's, juggling a lot we just do our best that's all we can do and in terms of the team um we've done a lot of things just to make sure that you know we're still cohesive given this really strange time and we're all over the place so we're doing um stand-up meetings twice a week via zoom we're doing twice a week happy hours um you know we're constantly uh, on slack um you know talking to each other so we're really doing our best i'm really proud of our team i think we're doing some of our best work ever actually over the past couple of weeks the caliber mm -hmm. media that we are securing for our clients we, we've been writing for them supporting them reactive statements um given this in this really strange moment in time. I'm super proud of them and we're really doing our best. That being said, you know, at every cocktail hour we do what the over under is and we'll be back in the office together. We built an amazingly tight knit culture and we just love being together. We love being in the office. We love having our Friday at Friday afternoon in person happy hours. Um, so we're really looking forward to being back together, but managing the best we can. And like I said, doing some of our best work ever. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so being you said a little bit about um reactive um in the whole COVID-19 space has that been um a struggle or um a kind of a thing that you kind of had to pivot to uh kind of handle for all of your clients because I know that for you know your average business there was a lot of pivoting and uh I'll call it damage control where you were just like okay yeah. like we have to do a couple of changes on the website we need to get this message out we need to let people know that we're being safe you know we're cleaning the facility whatever that have may have been what was there a lot of that for your clients for sure. So we have a content team and, and all they do is, is writing for us. So we have some of the best writers and I think that's also why we've grown in such a successful agency. The writing is just next level. So we did a lot of like reactive statements or um, proactive statements. Here's what we're doing to ensure safety of our facility, a safety of our employees, safety of our customers. And we did a ton, a ton of writing. Also just preparing for, you know, we got very, not very lucky. It's appropriate that we were deemed an essential business, but in some states or some cities, it changed within 24 hours. We were closed, deemed essential, open for just medical, open for everybody. So there was a lot of fast moving parts. Like, wow. like I've never seen like things change in 24 hours like this. So preparing those statements, what should happen if we should get closed down again. So really making sure that we reacted, we're proactive and planning for the future because this is this is a, a pandemic like we've never seen before in our lifetimes. Um, so preparing um, for every scenario, so really setting up our clients for what's to come, and also um, just making sure that we're there for them. You know, the the day after, I I personally called every single one of our clients and said, "We are here for you. Um, let us know we can help because comms we're going to be such an important part um, of this whole um, moment in time." Sure, definitely. So I have a two part question for you. Um, is there anything that you wish you knew when you started? And then is there any advice that you would give to someone at any part in their journey or maybe when they're starting or anything like that? Okay, so, um, so I'll answer both. So what I wish I knew was um, just how rewarding this was going to be. Like, if you see the smile on my face, I have never uh, been like more energized in my life than what I'm doing now. So I wish somebody told me earlier, like, take that leap of faith. 
you know, like, I guess I did it in many ways because I took on cannabis as, as like my, uh, as my passion really early on, but actually scaling a business and institutionalizing what we're doing. I wish I'd done it a year earlier. I would have saved myself a lot of stress if I had just asked for help a little earlier. So I guess my message is, you know, find your passion and then do whatever you need to do to make it, you know, the, the biggest part of your life, right? If I had not had my partner come in and help me, we'd not hired, I wouldn't be where I am today. So take that leap of faith and just go all in. Awesome. And then um, I forgot the second part of my question. Did you answer both? I think she answered yeah, both. Yeah, I think I, I, think I said like yeah. what I went with, you know, like how yeah. much fun this would be and just ask for help and, you know, just go big. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I had another question, but I forgot. It's so hard when you're listening and thinking at the same time. <laughs> this is a uh, problem, by the way. So, <laughs> um, so I, I guess I have a question, and this is more about your company itself. What do you guys do uh, via social media and um, your own marketing campaigns and things like that? Do you guys have a podcast, or do you? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, do you so have a strategy are, behind yourself? We actually are about to launch a podcast. We're working on it, but we've been a little bit busy, busy with the COVID, but it's definitely on a roadmap of things, how we're going to market. Uh, there are a few things that we do. Um, we have a great social media team, and one of their clients is Maddio. Um, also, one of our account executives, one of her accounts is Maddio. So like, I have my own publicist, um, so which is, which is sort of like ironic or, or funny, and, and I love it because she's great, and uh, I get these amazing opportunities. So we do have like a specific lane just for the agency to help us gain visibility. We also have a, a weekly newsletter we send out. We're actually sending it out um, bi-weekly now um, because of COVID. We just have like much more that, we're, um, that we want to be sending out, so we're sending out a few more um, – a few more communications like with our clients and our database and people who have signed up for it, just keeping people, their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in cannabis, um, a few of our you know, thoughts on what's happening in this space. So that's our way of just um, being thought leaders. Uh, we do a lot of conferences. I speak on a lot of panels. So those are the ways that we um, put ourselves out there. But really, I, you know, I, I, well, it's, it's great. And I love talking about the agency. Um, you know, most of our work is focused like on, on what our clients do. So our social media team um, is bar is bar none like one of the best in the space. Really understanding the intricacies of like what we can post. You know, making sure that we're not shut down by Instagram or our clients are not because we've heard horror stories where like uh, a company has built um, their 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 feed for years and years and years and then something happens and they get flagged by instagram and all gets shut down so we've done really smart things like making shadow sites to make sure we don't lose all of our content um and just really doing those workarounds to make sure that um that we're, we're being compliant with all the rules of the social networks um and also just making sure that we're you know we're pushing our clients message forward in the most compliant way yeah, and to speak to that about Instagram and Facebook, the very unfortunate thing is that there is no su customer support, really. No. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult yeah. to get in touch with someone that, you know, can help. And uh, they usually just shut you down and give yeah. you no uh, ex explanation at all. So, um, you know, that's that's really smart of you guys to, to make sure that, uh, that you're compliant, but not only, you know, have, you have a backup plan. Yeah, always prepare. Yep, most definitely. Um, so I had a general question just about the cannabis industry as a whole, um, you being in the space and, you know, you know, uh, having like these, these clients, is there anything new or interesting coming out that's more specific around just like cannabis in general, that's like, I don't want to say mind blowing, but just like, oh, like this is something to maybe like look forward to in the industry. Well, there are a few things. Um, one is really the um, isolating of the different cannabinoids. So there's things like CBG and CBN, which are great for like sleep and anxiety. Um, there was uh, some of the cannabinoids that they say are help with um, in appetite suppressants or really just finding those like critical cannabinoids that can help in different parts of your life. And that allow people to have really more targeted um, experiences with cannabis. Also like a little bit of a shift, not cannabis. We're starting to see uh, psychedelics. Um, become a really um, interesting uh, business um, and science and way for people to, to help themselves, you know, in, in a plant-based way. So we're starting to work with some uh, early stage psychedelic companies um, to start pushing that forward, like ketamine and psilocybin um, are the next phase of plant medicine. So we're starting to go down that alley as well. Wow. Interesting. Um, 
So I, I figured that we would wrap it up, but I have one final question for you. Where, what's next for uh, Matteo? Like, what, where where is Matteo going? So we think about this a lot. So of course, um, we want to continue to grow our team and grow our client base. Um, but we are opening offices um, in Ca- in Canada and in LA to make sure that we have presence in some of the key markets that we really um, have a strong presence in. Um, and then also to um, expand our our services base. So. Um, we're adding, like I said, a programmatic ad network. We are doing a lot more content, making sure that we're bolstering um, our client base with um, with the services that they need. Because we, they're coming to us and saying, hey, this is the next thing we're thinking about. Do you do this? Can you build this? Um, and we feel like we have the expertise to be able to do that for our clients. So continue to grow the team, the services, the client base, and then, of course, expand to our new offices. Okay. Very That's cool. so exciting. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a I- good time. We're really excited about the future. Yeah, no, I mean, once this is all over, I feel like everyone's coming out swinging. So, yeah, um, what are you for? Correct. And then I, one last question because I forgot. Do you, um, any books that you would suggest or um, podcasts that you listen to or maybe people that you don't know but like look up to on the internet? Uh, anything like that that you use to like either educate yourself or use for entertainment purposes within your space? Yeah. So, um, those who know me and who like follow me on social, um, I'm very into uh, fitness and exercise. So my escape um, is really listening to fitness podcasts um, and reading like fitness books. They just it's just my escape. I, I feel like really energized by by working out. So I, I listen to Beyond the Bikini Radio. I listen to Mind Pump Radio. Really all like fitness based um, podcasts and, and fitness books um, like Matthew's book. So those are just uh, my escape and, and just gives me like a peace of mind and sets me up for success. Awesome. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for taking out the time today to to hang out with us and tell your story. Uh, where can everyone find you uh, on social? And if they wanted to contact you, where, where can they get at you? Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. I always love um, telling our story and, and connecting with people like you guys. Um, you can be you can reach us at Matteo Communications um, on Instagram and uh, Matteo Communications on Facebook, uh, Matteo Communications on LinkedIn, um, and you connect with me personally at Rosie at Matteo.com. Awesome. awesome. And then Rosie, real quick, where is your firm located? So, someone um, asked in the Facebook comments. Just wanted uh, to we're located um, in New York City right now. We're in Hell's Kitchen. Awesome. awesome. Hell yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Right now I'm in my <laughs> but you know, soon. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Talk yeah, to you thank soon. you so much for taking the time. Take care, guys. Of course. Bye.